thank you very much for the invitation to um, really happy to be able to present uh, some of the new results, not all of which from our group, but um, uh, to give a, 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 an overview on um, the uh, experiments on hydrogen and uh, QD test and as it stands now. Um, I should probably first mention a few people that I've been working with over the years. So some of the experimental things that I'm going to talk about has been done in the group of Ted Hench. And here you see quite a long list of, of uh, PhD students and postdocs uh, that uh, are still contributing to, um, uh, to our experiments and have been contributing in the past. And uh, also we had some very important uh, uh, support from Alan E. Sirt of the Observatoire de Paris. Um, and these guys uh, run, as you may know, a very precise cesium fountain clock and that can be transported and has been visiting our labs uh, a few times for the, for the most accurate measurements. So uh, before I start uh, 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 talking about experiments and comparison of uh, theoretical predictions and experimental results, this is the main topic of this, of this, of this talk, I would like to walk you through the last 100 years of hydrogen theory. So, so of course, that's a bit challenging to do this in a, in a very short time, but I assume that you have some knowledge already. But let me start with um, a very simple, the simplest approach maybe, which is the attempt on uh, describing the hydrogen atom with, in terms of classical physics. So if we have a classical particle, and if we talk about hydrogen, the particle will be an electron, of course. So this is an electron here. And in, in classical physics, the motion of particles just follows a trajectory. And this trajectory um, has, corresponds to a, um, a, a defined position and a defined momentum and a defined speed at all times. And we know that this is not um, really what uh, takes place, of course, in, in quantum mechanics. But let's see what happens if we don't, don't have a, uh, a free particle uh, moving, but we confine it to somehow. Say, for example, we could confine the electron um, with, say, two mirrors or two plates, capacitor plates that are, have oppositely charged or something like this. And now this electron or this particle will bounce back and forth. So now it's confined. And the reason why this makes uh, things different is now that this particle now is accelerated. Okay, so it's accelerated at the edges of these, of these capacitors or of the confinement. And this acceleration causes the, uh, the system to radiate. You, you know, all know from electrodynamics that uh, accelerated charges radiate and since it radiates, it will eventually slow down, okay, and come to a stop at some point because it is simply accelerated. So how, how is that connected to the hydrogen atom? Well, the hydrogen atom has an electron and this electron is confined and we might think of, in classical terms now, of this electron to be on an orbit like, in, in, like, like, like a planet, like a, a, a tiny planetary system which we might call the Kepler model or the Kepler atom here. And again, what we see is that this electron is accelerated and it should decay. And if you uh, put in the math, you calculate how long this electron should be in orbit for the given, the observed sizes of the, of the, of the atom, then you would find that this atom, this Kepler atom should decay within roughly one picosecond. So all these atoms that are surround us should not exist. Okay, it should, the electron should drop into the, into the nucleus and it should be gone. And of course, that's not what we observe. Electrons or atoms live much longer. And so that's a big discrepancy of classical physics. So that's, this was one of the main problems why people like 100 years ago could not really describe at uh, the existence, even the existence of atoms in terms of classical physics. The other problem that uh, was already known even before that is that the spectrum of atoms or the spectrum of hydrogen consists of sharp discrete lines. So which means 
that the electron orbits are not, a, there's not a continuum of possibilities of different orbits, but there must be different shells where these electrons can sit. It's not like a planetary system. I mean, in principle, you could place a planet at any distance to the sun and it would, it would be stable. But here in this Kepler uh, uh, atom, this fails. And so here you see the spectrum of hydrogen. This is, these are some Balmer lines. And this has been empirically found out that the inverse of the wavelength of the light that is emitted is actually proportional to some constant here, which is the Rydberg constant, and the, in, the difference of the inverse of two integer numbers squared. They knew that empirically, and Balmer was actually the first to figure this out for the Balmer series, and then Rydberg expanded it by adding another integer number here. Okay? So that gives a, uh, another discrepancy, and which means that uh, classical physics here completely fails to describe that system. So this is what I just said. So classical physics gives no reason for the observed quantized orbits. So OK, let's try quantum waves, or well, I shouldn't say, well, this is actually quant uh, quantum mechan the quantum mechanical description, which is uh, simply a wave description. So it uh, came out roughly about 100 years ago with Bohr and de Broglie that matter actually also has wave properties. And now we describe this electron not in terms of a trajectory, but in terms of a wave. Then this wave has a certain wavelength, and de Broglie figured out that this is the de Broglie wavelength, which is inverse proportional to the momentum of this particle. Um, I should say here, and probably you've already learned from Serge Roche, that uh, this, the meaning of this wave is not really clear to us. Still today, there's debates on what this wave means. But one can think of it as sort of a density density of charge or density of matter or something like this. Or you can think of it as a probability of finding this atom somewhere here. Okay? And uh, usually this is, in, this is expressed in terms of a complex wave, which means that the density is actually homogeneous here, but I can't really draw a complex function in this way. OK, so now uh, if we have this quantum or a wave or a quantum wave description of the electron, what happens if we confine it? If we confine such a wave, this means that we get two counter-propagating waves. It's not like the classical electron that bounces back and forth, but now we have two counter-propagating wave, waves that actually form a standing wave. Okay, so a standing wave, and uh, there is a restriction on the wavelength, right? Because we want to have zero probability or zero density at the edges, and this means that, the, that uh, an integer multiple n of the de Broglie wavelength must match into this restriction L in here, OK? And um, yeah. So the standing wave is, in some sense, a static thing. So now if you think of a, a complex wave and you take the square modulus of which, then this thing actually doesn't move, OK? In some sense, the wave does move, but there is no flow of mass or charge or anything, and there's no acceleration. And hence, there is no radiation, and so this means that this thing is actually stable. So it does not slow down. It can sit there essentially forever, according to this description. If you apply this for an atom, then it explains both of the discrepancies that I had on the previous slide. It explains why uh, there is only an integer, where there's only discrete orbits uh, around, this, uh, around this nucleus because these orbits have to fulfill this resonance condition here. So the circumference of one of these orbits must be an integer multiple of the de Broglie wavelength. And uh, also it explains this, the, discrete, uh, the, 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 the discrete spectrum of which, because the orbits, the orbits are, uh, are restricted, and it explains the stability. In fact, it actually overshoots so, somehow what, uh, what, uh, uh, what was the problem before, because now all of these orbits are stable, okay? They are indefinitely stable, and so this means in the modern language, the excited states cannot even decay anymore. So they are even more stable than we would wished for. And the reason is that this, uh, this is a discrepancy, of course, with observations, but the, uh, the, the reason for this discrepancy is that this model is not complete. It's just the first shot, so to speak, so the first basic idea. And there's a lot of things missing. In particular, there's the quantum vacuum 
missing. And the quantum vacuum causes actually these excited states to decay. If you don't put them in, you don't get it out, of course. Okay. So this idea was actually put forward by Niels Bohr of a little bit like 100 years ago. And even though he expressed it a little bit, a little bit differently, so he didn't argue with the de Broglie wavelength because the de Broglie wavelength uh, was invented only 10 years later by de Broglie. But he would argue with the momentum, okay? So the de Broglie wavelength is essentially the inverse of the momentum, and he would just argue that the momentum on these, of these electrons must be an integer multiple of h, uh, of h bar. And, uh, but essentially, he gets the same result. So if you take this seriously and you put in the attractive force between the electron and the proton, and you solve that with this boundary condition, then you, in fact, get this formally empirically known uh, Rydberg formula, and you even get an expression for this Rydberg constant. So this actually pops out from this simple assumption that this electron is not just described by a trajectory, but it's described by a wave. Okay? So, of course, that's not the end of the story. This is just the beginning. This was the basic and very important step. But there's a lot of things missing, and I've, I'm listing here a few things that are missing in this simple Bohr model. First of all, this Bohr model is actually a two-dimensional model, right? So this would sort of predict that the atom is kind of a pancake shape, and we don't really believe that, right? So we, we, would, like to, we would actually like to have the atoms to be spherical, at least in the ground state. And so what one needs to improve this is one needs to have a three-dimensional wave equation and solve it and find the, the resonance condition. And this has been done by Schrödinger. Schrödinger uh, set up this three-dimensional wave equation, and you could solve it, and you get some additional shells and some elliptical orbits, if you like. They have different forms, but you also get the simple Bohr uh, orbits. And uh, some time ago, I've actually made some rendering of this, of this solution of this, of, this, of this Schrodinger equation. So what you see here is actually not a, a, a simple uh, orbit, because that would be static, as I said, so it's not radiating. But what you see is actually a transition from an S-state, so it starts out um, spherically in an S-state, and then it, it uh, does a transition to a P-state, which has these um, uh, double humped structure in the end. And uh, when it uh, arrives at the P state, you will see that it becomes static again. Okay? So this is sort of a three-dimensional uh, solution, and one should think of the, of, the, uh, of the electron not as a particle that flips around, but it should, you should think of it as some sort of a bubble that, that is, has different shapes which are allowed by the resonance condition of the, of the wave equation that belongs to it. So Schrodinger improved this, the Schrodinger equation improved this, but it's still not complete. There are still things missing, and one of the things that are missing is the Schrodinger equation is not relativistically correct. And if you go back to this Bohr model and you sort of, with a hand-waving argument, calculate the speed of the electron, even though I just told you that there is no speed, okay, you can still do that, and you find that it's on the percent level of the speed of light. Okay, so you, we should not expect that this description here would be more accurate than, than, uh, than a percent, or depending on how the relativistic correction actually scale, they scale actually with that, uh, with the speed of light, with the speed, that speed squared, as, um, as, as I will show you in a, in a few seconds. So this was actually a big problem at that time because people didn't know how to quantize a relativistic a description of this until Dirac came up uh, with his equation, and which is then called the Dirac equation. And the Dirac equation is sort of the big brother of the Schrodinger equation, which is relativistically correct, and you can solve it. And of course, you get more features out of this. For example, what comes out uh, of the Dirac equation is the spin, so that the electron carries a little angular momentum that is not, does not come out from the Schrodinger equation, and this has been observed before. And also what comes out is the antiparticles. So that is not in the Schrodinger equation. And uh, so this, this is a, an even better description. Still, it is not complete. There are still things missing in the, in the Dirac equation. And one of the things that are missing are some descriptions, some accounting for the vacuum effects, okay? 
So the vacuum in classical physics is just empty space. The vacuum in the quantum system is just the ground state, okay? The ground state of some fields that could be there, okay? For example, the electronic vacuum is there even if there's no electron or no positron, still the electronic vacuum is there. The photonic vacuum is there even though there's no photons or there might be, there may not be photons, the photonic vacuum is there. And this has not been uh, taken completely into account in the Dirac equation. Of course, it, it contains to some extent the electronic vacuum, right? But it, does not, it, but it does not include the photonic vacuum. If you throw these things in, then you end up with what we now call quantum electrodynamics. And this is essentially where the uh, theoretical description ended, essentially. Of course, there are more details that, uh, that would come in for the hydrogen atom, but there's no major, there's no major uh, missing thing uh, here. Uh, that, that, that still has to be accounted for. And so this is a description that is now about 50 years old, and people have used QED to calculate more and more terms of the energy levels of hydrogen, and it seems like that it was almost always in agreement with experiment. And this sort of never happened before in physics, I think, that uh, at least not in terms of the history of hydrogen, uh, that any time you have an improvement in, the, in, in, in measurement accuracy, say by an order of magnitude, one had to refine the theory to, uh, to, act, to accurately describe it. But since we have QED, we can measure six orders of magnitude more accurate, and we can calculate six orders of magnitude more accurate, and the theory has not changed. So maybe that's the end of the story, maybe it isn't. At the moment, there is actually some discrepancy, and this is what I'm going to talk about. And for that, we, I need to mention a few more other things that are missing uh, in this QED description. Uh, even here at this level, if you apply to the hydrogen atom, one has to take into account the finite size and the finite mass of the nucleus. Like Dirac, for example, or even Schrödinger and Bohr, they all treat the, uh, the, the, the nucleus as infinitely heavy as a first approximation. And uh, you probably know, or you may know, that in the Schrodinger equation, one can simply replace the electron mass by the so-called reduced mass to take all of these so-called recoil correction, that's the recoil motion of the, uh, of, of the, of the, of the nucleus that uh, is due to the finite mass. And uh, one can replace the electron mass by the reduced mass in the Schrodinger theory to take into account these corrections. And so this is the little cartoon picture from the classical uh, picture that I had at the beginning. Um, sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's, it's irritating, and very often it's completely misleading. So you have to use that carefully. But here in this case, you can sort of imagine that the, uh, nu the nucleus and the electron, they go around their common center of mass, right? So there's a motion of this nucleus, and that changes the energy levels slightly. In Schrodinger, that's easy to take into account for um, the Dirac equation. Uh, this is much more complicated because in the Dirac equation, uh, the two particles, roughly speaking, don't have the same eigentime because they live in different speeds. It makes it much more complicated. In fact, it makes it so com more complicated that one has to come up with a series expansion of these, of these corrections. And the finite size actually also plays a role because this three-dimensional wave actually lives everywhere in space, of course, with a different amplitude. And uh, in particular, the S states have a large amplitude at the nucleus itself. So the electron sort of feels the size of the electron. That makes some small corrections. And there's more things that need to be taken into account. For example, the nucleus might be polarizable, in particular if you, we talk about deuterium, and then there are other particles that are not, not present in the atom, but they still contribute with their vacuum state, like hadrons and muons and so on and so on. So these make small corrections. So to be a bit more um, quantitative, you know, I'm trying to uh, rewrite this, what I just said, uh, in equations. So if we, if, you, if we write down the energy levels, the energy is essentially one over the emitted wavelength, right? That's the energy difference is, is, is because one over the emitted wavelength is, uh, is essentially the frequency. Now these energies are given by minus one over n squared, where n is an integer number. And uh, I just uh, wrote this down in Rydberg units. So I'm just picking units and I'm free to do so, so right? Just by using different 
measures, I can just set the readback constant equal to one, and then I get this sort of expression here, okay? Um, one thing that I should uh, emphasize here, or that I should say here is, um, when it comes to constants in physics that need to be adapted to measurements, these constants always reflect our inability to calculate something, right? So this means, or it reflects our, our, uh, our lack of knowledge of certain, of certain things. In the Schrodinger description, there's no such thing as, a, as an adjustable constant. If you pick the right units, there's no constants that, that go in. Zero, okay? So that's actually the, uh, the uh, this is actually the, the dream of, of, uh, of a metrologist that, or not a metrologist, that did the, uh, the best description that we can have in physics, right? That we can have an ab initio description of the nature without uh, uh, having to adapt some of, of the constants. Unfortunately, uh, as I was showing in the last slide, this is not exactly uh, true, and we need to have these, we need to apply these refinements, and now if we um, write the same thing with the, in the Dirac uh, description, so this is the energy levels that one gets out when solving the Dirac equation, then you see it gets more complicated, and now this little n is replaced by n plus something here, and this uh, capital N is actually related to the small n, which is the, int the integer number, the, the principal quantum number, and then there's more things that come in here, k and gamma, but k is um, related to the total angular momentum of the electron, which means the spin and the orbital angular momentum, right? So that's a quantum number as well, and so that describes, that describes the state. And there's this gamma thing here, which actually introduces a new constant which is the fine structure constant alpha that shows up here for the first time. Um, well, Dirac didn't invent it, uh, but uh, in this description it shows up here for the, for the first time. And this fine structure constant is a dimensionless constant. Um, as a dimensionless constant means that uh, it, you cannot make it go away by picking the right units because it is already unitless, right? So this is roughly one over 137, and it would have, we assume it would have the same value here at, at another planet with a different SI system, okay? It will, have, it will be one over 137. Nobody knows how to calculate it. So which means that this actually does reflect our lack of knowledge of some things that, that go on here, and we have to fix this constant by measurements, okay? So that's a bit unfortunate, and it takes away some of the predictive power of the theory. However, we cannot simply go back to this equation because we know it's not correct, and this is, uh, can easily be seen by looking at this additional quantum number, so different uh, uh, states with different total angular momentum should now have different energies. However, if they have the same total angular momentum and the same principal quantum number, Dirac actually predicts they would have the same energy. Okay, so if one has a refinement like this, going from Schrodinger to Dirac, the first thing one, one should do is uh, to expand this, and if you just type this in into, say, Mathematica and say, serious expansion, this is what you get, and, uh, and it's reassuring that the first, the leading term here is actually just the Schrodinger term. And uh, we can say even more by looking at this expansion, so this is on the order of unity, then we see that the first correction is roughly uh, 10 to the minus four. So this is 1 over 137 squared. So which means if you are only interested, say, in the first four digits of your energy levels, then the Schrodinger description would be okay. But if you are measuring more accurate, and we now approach 15 digits of accuracy, you definitely have to take this into account, and of course, much more of these terms. And uh, as I said before, you also have to take into account the a finite mass of the nucleus, and here I'm writing this in terms of the electron to proton mass ratio, so I'm assuming the nucleus is a proton, and again, uh, just, just like expanding this thing here, you should uh, immediately make that check, what happens if you put this proton mass to infinity, then you see that this big bracket thing just goes to one, and this is uh, the, uh, the, the solution for the infinitely heavy nucleus. So the other things that I mentioned that, that come in is the vacuum, the, uh, the photonic and the electronic vacuum, and this is uh, usually um, 
called the um, self-energy and vacuum polarization contribution. More precisely, um, the self-energy self and the vacuum polarization difference between a free electron and a bound electron, because each of those are infinite, and, but the difference is finite, and this actually shifts the energies slightly, and uh, this shift has been called the Lamp shift, okay, because it has first been discovered by Lamp and, and Rutherford uh, by looking at the uh, splitting of the, of the uh, 2s one half and the 2p one half state. They should, according to the Dirac description, should have the same energy because they have the same principal quantum number and the same total angular momentum, but they are split by about one gigahertz, and this is caused by these additional effects. And uh, here, at least at this, at this point, it is uh, um, a good idea just to use a series expansion, and the series expansion is actually just given as a series expansion in alpha, and uh, so with co coefficients here um, that uh, uh, can be calculated, and uh, each of these coefficients are uh, it could be a very complex calculation, so that this means it is not just a number, and uh, it could be a very complicated function, and it also depends on other constants that go in. The other thing that I have changed here is I've now uh, written this in SI units because this is going to be important when we compare with the experiment. So the SI unit means, going to SI units means just multiplying this, all of this with the Rydberg constant, and you see because I'm multiplying all of this with one constant, it is just a unit converter. So the, as the Rydberg constant, in this context at least, is just the conversion of units to hertz and meters and so on. Um, if you are interested in finding a complete collection, this is the reference, because these, these, uh, these coefficients, there are hundreds of them, they are scattered uh, in the literature and it's very tedious to actually collect all of them. One important thing here for the analysis uh, for, for the of the experimental data is how many parameters do we have now here, okay? And I've smuggled in yet another one, which is this term here that I have not mentioned. And, well, I have because I was speaking about the finite size correction of the finite proton size, which is this thing here. This is the charge radius of the proton that makes a small correction to the energy levels. Uh, this term here, actually, if you put in the numbers, this term is actually quite small, but uh, don't uh, be confused about the size of these terms. It still contributes to the largest uncertainty. So a term could be small, but could have a large uncertainty. And this is just because these big terms here, they are incredibly well accurate. Uh, in particular, this one here, it's just an integer. There's nothing to adjust. It's infinitely precise. And uh, so, now one has to also find the, uh, the, the right size of the proton here. Okay, so let's make an inventory about the parameters that go in into the theoretical description. If you are, from a puristic point of view, if you are very strict, then you, should, you have to say that any physical parameter that exists goes into here. For example, there's gravitational attraction between the proton and the electron, right? So the gravitational constant enters. But it enters at such a low level, okay, that we can, for, for the moment, forget about it. So the number of parameters that we actually have to take into account depends uh, on what has been measured already, how accurate has it been measured, and what has been measured with other experiments. So it's a complicated question, actually. And let me just explain that we are actually left with two essential parameters when it comes to hydrogen spectroscopy. So what we had so far is the fine structure constant, the electron to proton mass ratio, the Rydberg constant, and the charge radius of the proton. All other constants that may enter are just way too small. We don't have to take care of them. Now the question is, can we take some of these parameters maybe from other experiments? Okay, and in fact, that's possible with uh, two of them. And uh, for example, one can use the, the G factor, which is the uh, the ratio of the magnetic moment to the angular momentum of the, uh, of the electron. And this quantity is a pure QED quantity and it can be calculated using quantum electrodynamics. And again, we get a power series, of course, a different power series in alpha. So if you are not into the theory side, that's at least my approach, QED describes everything that it can describe as a power series in alpha. Okay, now we can measure this very accurately. Well, we can't, but other people can do if you're interested in the references here. 
um, can measure this, this quantity very accurately, and one can calculate these coefficients and find a good value for the fine structure constant, assuming QED is correct, and of course, assuming that the measurement is correct. Okay, so there's an assumption. And this is actually the, one of the most uh, accurate values for the fine structure constant that one can get. And there's another one, this is almost getting as accurate, and it's actually done here in Paris um, by, the, by the group of Francois Birabin, um, where the, uh, one uses the, this expression for the Rydberg constant and using hydrogen spectroscopy that fixes the Rydberg constant, inverting this expression, and then one can measure a recoil a recoil shift of an atom, and I think we have seen this in the last lecture. This uh, uh, recoiling atom causes a frequency shift. This can be measured very accurately, and one can uh, determine a value for the fine structure constant. Um, another very accurate measurement that can be done is um, the measurement of mass ratios. And uh, I should say here that uh, that when, you, when it comes to very accurate measurements in physics, only frequencies can be measured very accurately. So if you, if, you really, if you really want to push the accuracy to the limit, then you should not measure anything but a frequency, okay? And which means that you should not measure, say, a magnetic field or a mass, okay? Um, uh, if you, uh, if you, uh, can, if you uh, trap such a particle with, uh, with, an, with, a, with a charge to mass ratio in a magnetic field, in a penning trap, you get this cyclotron frequency here. The cyclotron frequency can be measured very accurately because it is a frequency, okay? And, but it depends on this magnetic field. But now if we uh, uh, co-trap two particles in the same uh, in the same magnetic field, then we could measure frequency ratios, and the, fre the frequency ratio, the, uh, the magnetic field that is very difficult to measure accurately, drops out, and we are left with the mass ratio, okay? This is just because we measure frequency ratios of cyclotron frequencies. And these mass ratios can be determined up to something like 12 digits in some cases, okay? So these are actually all measurements that are done in penning traps. So these penning traps, even though we don't really like them for spectroscopy because of the last large Zeeman shifts and so on, uh, can actually contribute very accurate measurements. So this means that this thing goes away and uh, the fine structure goes away, structure constant goes away for us because we can just use them for, from, from these other measurements and we are left with these two parameters that we need to determine. Okay, so now let's uh, quick, uh, sh uh, briefly go back to a more uh, uh, principal uh, point of view on how to test theories. So suppose that we have a theory without any adjustable parameters, like the Schrödinger equation. Schrödinger equation has no adjustable parameters if you work in the right units, which means atomic units. Then you could use the theory to compute a measurable quantity. You compare the prediction with the experiment, and you're done. You have tested the theory. That's what we want, okay? It is more complicated if you have a theory with adjustable parameters. Of course, if you have n adjustable parameters, you can make n measurements, and you have said nothing about the theory, because you can always adjust these n parameters to match exactly your measurements, okay? And if the theory contains more adjustable parameters and things you can measure, then it's not even a theory anymore, okay? It has zero information, zero predictive power, okay? Which is not the case for QED, but we have two parameters, okay? And I've already said this, the best test is measure a frequency. So we want to measure some experimental transition frequency, and we have a theoretical description that depends on parameters, and we want to have several of them. And uh, frequency measurements are the best you can do is like never measure anything if, if, uh, but frequency. This is citing R. Charlo, and that's, uh, that's the, the, the main theme of uh, high accurate, accurate measurements in physics. So to give you an example, I've already said this, uh, the Schrödinger equation predicts, for example, that the transition frequency between the 1s and 2s and the 2s and the 4s, if we take the ratio here, you plug in the Schrödinger energy levels, the Rydberg constant drops out and one comes out as four. So that's actually the prediction of the Schrodinger theory in atomic units. It says that this frequency ratio is exactly four. And from what I said before, we expect it to be 4.000 something, and then after the fourth digit, something else will come, or maybe it's 3.9999, I don't remember, I have to say. So when it comes to QED, um, we have two parameters, as I just 
told you, as it stands at the moment, of course that depends on other things that might have been measured, we, comp we compute transition frequencies and we measure two frequencies to fix these parameters and then we haven't tested anything. Any additional measurement then can test QD and this is actually what we are after, right? So any additional measurement, a third frequency could test the theory or a fourth and so on. The more we have, of course, the better could be the, could be the testing. So um, here's, again, maybe some summary and maybe in a, in, a, in a different or maybe more useful picture, this is sort of the, the size of the effect. So the Schrodinger description this, uh, describes the, uh, the transition, or the energy levels between n equals one and n equals two, which is actually the ones that we are mostly interested. And uh, then the Dirac uh, equation actually shifts these, uh, these energy levels, but Dirac actually predicts that the 2s one half and the 2p one half is degenerate, degenerated, but uh, as Lamp and Rutherford have uh, found, this is not the case, and this splitting here is actually called the Lamp shift, which is then accurately described by quantum electrodynamics. Um, one should probably be a bit more careful with this term Lamp shift because it isn't really a shift, okay? It is actually a deviation. I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm express it in a sort of mean way, then this lamp shift is actually a deviation from a wrong theory, okay? That's all it is. And uh, the wrong theory in this case is the Dirac equation, okay? And then uh, at last, there's also the hyperfine structure, which I haven't mentioned at all. This is due to the coupling of the nuclear spin to the electron spin, and, but this hyperfine splitting can be measured very accurately with radio frequency means, and we always take it out from the measurement, so I'm not going to talk about this. What is um, the most interesting transition here is this transition from the 1s to the 2s state. And this transition is dipole forbidden, so we, we can't really assign a simple, um, a simple Rabi frequency, as uh, Serge did in his, in his lecture, um, because it uses two photons to excite. And, uh, and for the same reason, this 2s state is very stable because it cannot simply decay by emitting a single photon. It has to emit two photons, and that's why it lives an incredibly long time for an excited state, which means about a second, okay? So typical lifetimes of these other states are on the order of 10 nanoseconds, okay? So it lives for a very long time, which means that it provides a very sharp resonance, okay? The line width is on the order of one hertz, and uh, 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 this makes the 1s to 2s transition the sharpest of all resonances in atomic hydrogen, which means that for accurate testing, this is the main target. This two-photon excitation has another advantage, um, as I will show you in, when we talk about the experimental setup. This two-photon excitation means that uh, we can have uh, 243 nanometer light as a standing wave in a cavity and have an atomic hydrogen beam that propagates collinearly with these 243 nanometer light. Now, the standing wave corresponds to two counter-propagating waves, and this atom can absorb a photon from the back, okay, and one photon from the front. And now, uh, as we've seen in the last uh, presentation, the Doppler shifts of these two photons is actually minus k times v and plus k times v, so they add to zero. So that's a big advantage uh, because there is no efficient way yet to laser cool hydrogen. So we can't really make these hydrogen atoms very cold. Uh, all we can do at the moment is to blow them out through a cryostat, so they are roughly five Kelvin. So we are not talking about micro Kelvin temperatures here and so on. And the speed, the thermal speed that corresponds to five Kelvin is 300 meters per second. Now, 300 meters per second is 10, 10 to the minus six, well, it's 10 to the minus six times the speed of light, right? So the Doppler shift is 10 to the minus six in relative units. And that, of course, would completely kill our accuracy. But with this two-photon approach, this goes away. And one has to think, of course, what is the next uh, dominating systematic, of course. And, um, um, I will come to this in a moment. Uh, so uh, to generate this 243 nanometer lights, we use a diode laser that is frequency doubled twice, and uh, we also measure the frequency of this laser by using a frequency comb. So I'm not going to speak about the frequency comb here, but uh, I, I have to tell you what it does. The frequency comb is a method to coherently divide very large frequencies 
down to the radio frequency domain. So this is a very large frequency on the order of five, something like 500 terahertz, okay? And, uh, and 500 terahertz cannot be used to com compare it with an atomic clock using radio frequency counters. So we divide it down to a radio frequency uh, uh, that we can count with uh, radio frequency counters referencing with an atomic clock. And this is actually for the, for the, for the highest accuracy, the clock that we uh, got from our uh, French colleagues. I'll come to this in, in a second. So there's one more thing here that needs to be said, and this is this, uh, this chopper wheel here that turns on and off the excitation light. And uh, this uh, uh, will be clear in, in just a second. The other thing that, that is still missing is there is a Lyman alpha detector here and a little electric field where the two S atoms, so once we have the laser tuned at the right frequency, there, there will be two S atoms in this metastable state, and a little bit of an electric field will perturb this two S state. And the perturbation, if you already talked about perturbation theory, means that one adds other states in on, onto this two S state, which is, for example, a two P state. Two P state decays immediately. So in, in a sense, what happens is if the two S atoms enters a little, a little field region, it decays immediately and releases a Lyman alpha photon that we detect. So this is our detection that we have made, that we have promoted the 1S hydrogen atom to, to, to the 2S state. This is the, uh, an example of the, uh, of the lines that we see. Uh, so this is the laser detuning here in kilohertz measured at Lyman alpha. And uh, you see that uh, this, if you look at this curve first here, so the delay is zero, I'm going to explain what this delay means. If you look at this curve first, you see that it is slightly asymmetric. Right? And that's, of course, something you don't want to have if you want to make precision measurement. You want to have, you can accept line distortions that are symmetric, then even if you fit a symmetric function, which is the wrong function, to it, you still get the right center frequency. But if the distortion is asymmetric, that's what you don't want to have. The reason for this asymmetric distortion here is the second order Doppler effect. So the first order Doppler effect goes away because we have counter-propagating beams, but the second order does not go away. What's the second order? The second order is time dilation. So these atoms move with 300 meters per second, or 10 to the minus 6, the speed of light, okay? And so their time uh, uh, frame is different from the lab frame. Their eigentime is different, and that causes a shift that is one half of V over C squared, so which is 5 times 10 to the minus 13. And there are different atoms with different velocities, and the shift is proportional to V squared, so it shifts only to the red side. Okay, that's the second order Doppler effect, and that's, of course, a very bad systematic force. What we do here is to use this chopper wheel that I just mentioned, and we turn off the laser beam uh, frequently, and every time we turn it off, we wait some time. We wait for some delay time, and after this time, we detect the photons. Okay? If we waited long enough, then the fast atoms are all gone. We only look at the slow atoms. Of course, there are fewer slow atoms. That's why the signal drops down. And here's a blow up for longer, even longer delays. And one can show by using some Monte Carlo simulations and uh, the, the, the correct optical block equations that after a certain delay, we can simply fit Lorentzians to it and not affecting our, our uncertainty. But of course, we want to have also, oops, we also want to have this um, um, the strong lines here because they give us much better statistics, right? The undelayed line gives us good statistics and the delayed line gives us, give us good um, systematics, but, in, in, but essentially we want to have both. That's why we use a complicated line shape model which is drawn here in the solid line, uh, but that's, uh, that's very detailed and very involved to, to, to describe it. Now, if we extract the center frequency from such a fit, that was on the previous slide, and we plot the center frequency now in terms of the laser power that we use, we find something like this. And this is the light shift or the AC stark shift that also happens in the two photon transition. However, here it is different. I think we have just learned that on resonance for one photon transition, the light shift is zero. Here it is not the case because the two photon transition in some sense is never on resonance, right? Because you have this virtual level in between. So, and also you need to have a, a large laser power to drive it because it is weak, right? This transition is weak. And that's a notorious problem for two photon transition. We, you always have to fight with large uh, light shifts or AC stark shifts. And so the way we deal with this is we make such a graph here as a function of laser power and extrapolate to zero laser power. And this is essentially our 
uh, uncertainty here. It's one of the dominating uncertainties that, that we have in this, uh, in, in this game for the 1S, 2S. Here's a, an error budget of our last measurement, and you can see that the statistics is actually dominating, so which means that this corresponds to something like 10 days of data taking, and, uh, and, and then we have the second order Doppler effect and the line shape model and AC Stark and so on, and they're all more or less comparable. And all of these things are actually connected to the, to the speed of the atoms, all of them, right? If, if the atoms would sit at rest, we could turn down our laser power a lot and still see some signal because when the atoms move through the laser beam very quickly, we have to you know, use larger power to actually see a signal, right? So that's, that's how the AC stark shift or the light shift is actually connected to the speed of, of the atoms. And of course, then the signal Doppler is directly connected and the line shape model that is corresponds to this. So it would be very desirable to have cold or even colder atoms in, in the future. So um, uh, since uh, I'm here, I should, all, I should not forget to mention the contribution from, from Paris. And this is one of them. So this is the cesium fountain clock from Ellen Sirt that I mentioned before. And we borrowed this a few times. And of course, we didn't just borrow the clock, but we had to also borrow the operators and uh, the only the part that we were actually using for our experiment is this BNC connector here, okay? So this is the most important part of the clock and this puts out uh, a very well-defined frequency that we use to reference our frequency combs. We have another means, or we used to have another means to, uh, to get a very accurate optical frequency, which is uh, an optical fiber that connects our lab at Munich with the lab at Braunschweig, the uh, Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt, which is the standard institute in, in Germany. And they also run optical fountain, uh, they also run fountain clocks and also run optical clocks. And uh, using frequency combs on both sides and uh, hydrogen masers, we can actually run through these fibers a comparison and calibrate our local hydrogen maser relative to the maser in, uh, in Braunschweig. And if you are interested in and the details here are some of the references. Um, that's the hydrogen spectrometer in, in real life. So this is the uh, photograph that shows um, Nikolai Kolachevsky and Mark Fischer. Mark Fischer actually has left quite some time ago. So that picture is not one of the newest pictures, but it's, the spectrometer looks pretty much the same. This is the vacuum tank that houses the hydrogen beam that comes in from here and the laser system in the back. Of course, it's not just a box that says diode laser, but we want to have a one hertz wide laser and that needs to be stable and we use up the reference cavities and so on and so on. So that's uh, much more complicated than just, just a sketch. So this back table is essentially the laser. And the last measurement that we did on this 1S, 2S transition frequency has an uncertainty of only 10 hertz and the transition frequency is 2,466 terahertz or in wavelength units, this is 121 nanometers. And again, you could read the details if you like here in this, in this, in this reference. Okay, so now I've uh, mentioned the, uh, the measurement of one transition, which is the sharpest transition that you can have. And um, now I would like to come back to the theoretical description because in the end, we want to have both. We want to have experiment and we want to have theory and we want to merge them and see if they match or not. I've marked in red the parameters that are left to us. Okay, so there's the Rydberg constant, and this is because we use a cesium clock. We measure NSI units, that's why the Rydberg constant is in here. We don't measure atomic units, and the proton charge radius here. Now, the other things, the other two parameters that are important, I've already told you, they go away because we can extract them from other measurements. Now the question is, is it not, uh, we need to have two transition frequencies to determine these two parameters. And uh, the outcome for the Rydberg constant, as you can see, is a very accurate number. This is maybe an unusual way to express the Rydberg constant in Hertz, but we like frequencies, of course, because we only measure frequencies. And uh, this is one of the best known constants uh, because of these, of these measurements. But still, we need to have two transition frequencies to measure these, to determine these two constants first. And the question is, is it not, why is it not possible to have some other experiments determining, for example, the proton charge radius for us? And in fact, it might be. And here 
uh, some results that I've, it's not all of these results that have been uh, obtained over many decades on the proton charge radius from elastic electron scattering. So people scatter electrons from, from protons and by observing the cross section and the deflection, uh, one can determine the proton charge radius. Now if you plot this, these different experiments, you see that these error bars don't really overlap, right? So if this data would be consistent, then you would think that something like 70% of the error bars should, be, should overlap, but that's not the case, okay? So they are really, they are really excluding each other. Yeah? I mean, this, nobody believes in this value anymore, and I was told I shouldn't show it anymore, but, um, but still the, dis the discrepancy uh, is, is there, and that's why uh, uh, one approach, or at least our approach, is not to use these, uh, these, these, uh, one of these results uh, for the moment. And the other thing uh, that uh, needs to be said about the proton charge radius is this factor that you see here. Uh, this factor contains the electron mass squared and uh, there's another electron mass in the Ripley constant here. So which means that this thing is actually uh, proportional to the electron mass cubed. Now if you replace the electron with its big brother, the big brother is the muon, the muon is 200 times heavier, okay? This is 200 times cubed larger, okay? And so this is something like seven orders of magnitude, seven orders of magnitude, and this term here is no longer the smallest with the, with the largest uncertainty, but it becomes really big, okay? So this has been done by um, Randolph Pohl and Aldo Antonini, and uh, this is very complicated. Took, about ten, took them about 10 years to uh, make such a measurement because you can imagine it's not so easy to make muonic hydrogen and then even do spectroscopy with this. And they've did this, and they, what they extract is a proton charge radius that looks at here, and look at the error bars, way smaller, okay? So since we like hydrogen, and we also like muonic hydrogen and anti-hydrogen and hydrogen-like systems and so on, uh, we rather like to use this value here uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for, for the proton charge radius. And uh, I should say that even though this experiment is very complicated, it's conceptually easy. So the, uh, t there's not much you can actually do wrong uh, in obtaining this, 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 this result. Now, if we uh, go, if we ignore for the moment the electron scattering values for the proton uh, size, and we use just uh, hydrogen uh, for the analysis, what we can do is we can, for example, use the measured one is three years transition. This has been measured by François Birabin in, in Paris, and uh, by François Birabin group, I should say. And we, com we combine it with the one is two years from our lab, so then we have two frequencies, and we can determine two parameters, and one of which is the proton charge radius, the other one I'm not showing for, at the moment, and we get a value like this. So this large error bar doesn't mean that this measurement is much less accurate. In fact, the muonic hydrogen is much less accurate, but is much more sensitive to the large, it's seven orders of magnitude more sensitive to the, to the charge radius, right? And uh, we can then throw in other measurements. This is also from Birabin's group, um, the 2s to 12d um, transition, and determine another proton charge radius, and so on. And we could just throw in all the all transition frequencies that have been measured so far in atomic hydrogen, and always combine it with the 1s, 2s, and we get these values here for the proton charge radius. Now, what you can see is that well, it's not so easy to see, but you see that this data is actually consistent. It's not like, like, the, to, like the electron scattering data. So, and we can calculate st statistically uh, what the chi-square over degrees of freedom, and all of this seems to be statistically uh, correct, and which means we can average, okay? At least we should be able to average because these error bars are meaningful. And if we do that, what we get is this error bar here for the average hydrogen value, and now we see there is a four sigma discrepancy between the muonic hydrogen and the atomic or the regular hydrogen, electronic hydrogen if you want, and that is unexplained for a couple of years now. We don't know why actually this discrepancy shows up here, and of course there are many different suggestions, many different ideas, many different archive papers that come up with uh, theoretical 
ideas and then they, they are killed by other theoreticians, they know this cannot be because we have done this and so on. And uh, of course, you might think, uh, what if the one is two is, is wrong? Because then all of these will shift, because all of which uh, measure use the one is two is. Or what if the muonic hydrogen is wrong? Then, uh, then this should all, all, all shift. And uh, we can have a look at it by how much one would have to be wrong to explain this. Uh, before I, but I should also uh, emphasize here because this has caused some confusion because people think that the Rydberg concept is, is always incredibly accurate and uh, a lot of people thought that this would not only affect the proton charge radius, but remember, we need two transition frequencies and two parameters. So if we solve for the other parameter, which is the Rydberg constant, we get this plot, okay? So the only difference between the two plots is this axis, okay? So this discrepancy could as well be called the Rydberg puzzle, if you want. But since uh, the, uh, Aldo, and Aldo Antonini and Randolph Pohl, who were measuring the muonic uh, uh, hydrogen, they were uh, trying to determine the proton charge radius. And then this problem came up. It's called the proton size puzzle. And it might be that we just don't understand the proton accurately enough, or the theoreticians, I, so, I should say. So here's a table what could go wrong. Um, so we can ask the question is like, by how much do we have to shift this measured one as two is? By how much do we have to be wrong to uh, bring everything back into agreement? And how much, of course, has to be in relative units? So it could either be relative in uncertainties. So the one as two is must be 4,000 sigmas off to explain this. So we must be 4,000 sigmas, 4,000 error bars away from the true result to explain it. So we don't really believe that. So the one as two is, is probably a real anchor. And we can also uh, ex express it in relative line widths. That's, that's, uh, that's another issue, another fair comparison, probably even better, but it's still 40 line widths away. And for the, for the muonic hydrogen, it's very similar. So these guys must be off by 100 sigmas to explain this. So we don't believe that either. But it could be that some of these measurements here that all start from the 2s state, okay, except for this one here, they start from the 2s state, that there is some effects that actually shift them, but then it would be very difficult to believe that it will affect all of them in the same way, okay? So then we would expect more like something that, that, is, that has a larger scatter and is not statistically uh, consistent anymore. And uh, however, if you look in how much line widths one uh, have to shift these other transitions, then it's, uh, it's a frightening number. So for those of you who have had some contact with spectroscopy, uh, finding the line center within four digits of the line width is a very tricky, is a very tricky thing. Yeah. And the reason for that is that all these higher states here, they live very short as compared to the 2S state. So to make progress on this, what one has to do is one has to measure a, a broad line. There's only one that is really narrow, the one is two is, and one has to measure, because we have to determine these constants, um, uh, one has to measure a broad line, because there's no other option available with a very good accuracy and with a very good line shape model. And I think I was told that I should not. <laughs> yeah, but this is, Probably this is a good, a good point to, to stop here and uh, because uh, there are more details that may not be uh, so much interesting here anyway. And uh, I think I've, I was speaking for about an hour now. And so I would like to thank you with this for your attention. <laughs>